Welcome to Tactica Imperialis and to today's video. Today is episode 38 of Adeptus Podcasters, and as always, I am joined by Rem Lays from 40k Theories. Hello, everyone. And Ego Queen Alexis. Hey. Now, after the absolute slew of news that we had to fight our way through in the last episode, not so much this time. It's been it's been relatively quiet on the 40k front, mainly because Age of Sigmar has been getting stuff out of the wazoo. However, there is still some stuff that we can discuss, including validation of some rumours, and also just discussing some stuff, because that's fun, is it not? And the goldfish. And the goldfish. And the goldfish, yes, we'll get to that. Now, we'll take you back a couple of weeks to the Horus Heresy and Necromunda Weekender. Now, we knew some of the stuff that was coming out from this. We discussed Rogal Dawn last time. And also, we got the final validation of Constantine Valdor as a release. Uh, Dawn is on pre-order now, I believe. Uh, Valdor, I'm not sure. I was hoping someone would jump in and say, you know, that's the case. Sorry, I think, I think you cut out, mate. Do you might want to repeat that. Oh, right. Um, yes, Dawn is on pre-order, I believe. Uh, Valdor, I'm not sure when he's on his way out. Um, sorry if there were any audio issues. Uh, yeah, but Dawn so is about what... um, 75 quid, if I recall. So slightly above average. And then you got Valdor, who's 60. Yeah, although and I don't... Is he, on, is he on pre-order yet, or is that just the photo we saw on the back of a box? I'm not sure if he's up for pre-order. I know I'm not going to pre pre-order them, so I kind of didn't really care. Yeah, it's a very mixed bag of a model. I mean, I've got the photo in front of me, and a lot. I've heard people say it's very busy, and I know exactly what they're saying. It is a very busy model. Uh, 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 Valdor is not available to pre-order yet, but he is confirmed to be £60. Yes. Uh, he's got a thousand sun shoulder pad on his base, because he's doing his whole Prospero thing. Um, I've just noticed that's what his base is. It's Prospero. Lovely. Yeah, um, I bet that upsets you, doesn't it? It's like, Daddy, uh, stop, no. stop teasing me. Ooh. It's the literally only thing Valdor did in the entire Horus Heresy that's recorded very well, so fine. There's also a, um, a Rogal Dawn bundle to have him combined with Horus Heresy Book 3 so you can have him with his rules. Yay! Don't you love using models? Or you can to have the most. Or you can have what? the bundle of him with um, Alexis Pollux and Sigismund as well as a bundle. Although, as far as board work as I believe, said bundles do not actually get you any money off, do they? No, it's one hundred and fifty-six pounds for the three models. Yeah, well, it's just a one-click buy thing. Yeah, it's just speeding your life up. Now, also coming through that weekend, uh, release-wise, uh, we'll, we'll stick to the Horus Heresy for a moment. We have a Solar Auxilia Transport, the Argoran, which is... Is it is it a Chimera chassis or is it a Rhino chassis? I think it looks like a Chimera chassis to me. Actually, I think it's more of that... Um, is it the same chassis as the other transport vehicle they have? Uh, I haven't seen it. Uh, I'm just trying to compare it to the vehicles I know, because I know it's not a rust chassis, and it looks too long to be a rhino. So I'm not sure. Might just be a new ch a new type of chassis. I just noticed no, something on a different uh, pre-order release. Um, you know the Space Wolves Grey Slayer upgrade packs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, does anyone else notice that the bolters have their iron sights upside down? Their iron, their iron sights are underneath the barrel as opposed to above it. Space Wolves. That is all. In all fairness... I'm just going to say if someone's suits. fucked up. <laughs> I'm going to justify this by saying it's they don't need sights on their guns because their suits technically take care of that. So why are the iron sights still modelled upside down? Well, you see, because somebody at the Forge World thought it was a good idea. So in other words, someone fucked up. <laughs> or, 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 somebody was an anime fan. Somebody out there is going to I, get that reference. I, are you suggesting this, you. This, this is that scene from Soul Eater with a guy who fires his pistols upside down with his pinky fingers? Yes, I am. 
God, that anime sucked. Oh, what the flip? It, it, it was a shitty that anime. anime... It no, was shitty, okay, look. It was a shitty anime. anime the, the only good thing about it was the opening theme song, but that was it. It was shit. <laughs> that was it, a good anime. It was a steam pile of a dog shit. Rebellies, you like Transformers. I don't think you you can talk. Yeah, well, at least Transformers has reached level of decent pulp-level sci-fi. Yeah, Michael Bay is awesome. No, I'm talking about the classic Transformers, obviously. a Formers doesn't count. Let it rip. Out. And speaking of things that are blatantly references to something else, we have the two new assault, well, actually old assault drills. The Termite, which is a returning model from Epic, um, or from the Epic scale game Space Marine, whether it's from actual Epic, I'm not sure, because I didn't play Epic. Uh, and then we have the Imperial Mole, a model so on the nose that I genuinely can't believe it. Thank you. Yes, this thing, uh, do we not have a sense of scale because it's a digital uh, drawing, a, a digital mock-up? And it's going to be the uh, but, same size as the uh, Sisters of Battle uh, flying um, questionable vehicle. Sisters, Sisters of the Silence. Silence. It's got four, four sets of treads. It's going to be pretty damn long. Mm, I'm not sure we'll see. Um, is there a mechanic I'm, symbol on it? No. I'm going to assume it's around fell blade size. Yeah, I was going to go super heavy sort of scale. Um we also have a bunch of upgrade stuff. The original uh, Space Marine land speeder is uh, being reimagined into the Legion land speeder. Oh, that made me so happy. It's is... like we can actually have a Rogue Trader <laughs> style model that doesn't look like complete shit. It just looks mostly yeah. shit, but that's part of the charm. <laughs> Still looks like shit. Well, that's yeah, it's, 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 part, it's part of the charm of the Rogue Trader stuff. It looks it's shit, but, but it's got its own charm to it. But a nostalgic twi- twinkle to it. Uh, now, and we've also got... Oh, sorry, go on. Now, all we need are the Space Crusade era heavy weapons, like that missile launcher with the banana magazine. Yes. Um, are you referring to the... I've got an old Space Crusade Dreadnought with a missile launcher. Uh, I think it was a Chaos Dreadnought. We need the Dreadnought as well, just because we can have something that looks like an Ed 209 and 40k. I'm okay with that. And I'm just lost in references again. The, the big mech thing from the original Robocop. You know, drop your weapon, you have 15 seconds to comply, that thing. Oh, that thing, right, yeah, yeah sorry. And it just um, guns him down anyway. Sorry, I, I, I'm very b- bad at old movie references, sorry. Uh, right, what have we got here? Uh, we have a very interesting looking Magos Dominus, uh, one of the founding... The Dark Mechanicum and Nakaris Scoria. I say that's five times backwards. Oh, is it one looks like a giant scorpion? Yes, that one. Yeah, I like that model. It looks so cool. Yeah, I mean, it's basically like it, part of me wants to say it's kind of like corrupted Belisarius' call, but no, it's not. You, you know what I'm saying? It would be actually kind of interesting to see Belisarius' call mentioned in um, one of the Horus Heresy books. I really hope they do that. I really do hope they do that. Like, Cole just needs to be inserted to make his context in the past make sense so that he makes sense more in the present. All I gotta do is have for the, one of the last, I don't know, one, one of the last books, if not the last book, just have Gilliman go up to like, I need someone to undertake a new project. I'm calling it the Primaris Project. Can you do it, Belisarius Cole? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't have to be much. Just at least contextualize it, please, because... Cole is not a plot hole. He's just lacking in context. Yeah, ev- everyone knows if Rain's the plot hole. Oh, yeah, she is a yeah, water is. plot hole. I love your brain, though. She's so cute. But if Rain's lore is... Apart from, as I like to say, going all Doctor Strange on the Thousand Suns, it's, it's, it's pretty decent, to be fair, if Rain's the lore. She is a plot hole and needs sorting, but still pretty cool. She is the female cipher. She's just a walking deus ex mechanica. Machina. Well, no, no, I like... 
<laughs> I gotta stick with uh, Revelates is one on that one. That was good. Fair enough. Ex Mechanica. Also, also, when you mentioned Doctor Strange, uh, for a minute, Pabi was thinking of Doctor Strange Love, so I was thinking you were just gonna do a whole Mein Führer, I can walk reference. Yeah, but that would require me being cultured as an individual. And I'm just not. <laughs> I need to watch that film again. That was an awesome film. And finally, for the Horus Heresy, well, for the Horus Heresy, if not for the Weekender, we have probably Alpharius. The guy in the canoe. It's probably not Alpharius, it's probably Omicron. I mean, to be fair, with the way they talk about it, it's like, led by the Primarch of the 20th Legion himself, with his ornate helmet, it's very clear that he is Alpharius. They are clearly fucking up with us. Well, yeah, this is GW. They like... That's one thing I like about GW these days. They, they like to troll people. Yeah, but it, it's not like out and out. Well, it is out and out trolling, but it's the right... Like, it's tongue-in-cheek right trolling. Kind of, yeah, it's tongue-in-cheek. It's not just screw you. No. Yeah, it is... Well, unless your name is Laurie Golding and you want to just count the Blood Raven thing, but... Shh. And call all the fans a bunch of mewling fucktards. I don't think those are her exact words. No, no, they, they were. I've actually got the screen cap of the quote. <laughs> oh. Huh. <laughs> Oops. I didn't know that I wrote for Black Library. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on. That sounds like something I would say, not an actual it author. Does. But speaking <laughs> of um, weird, weird no. stuff, speaking of weird stuff, can we talk about the goldfish yet? <laughs> Uh, let's just let's cover ne- off Necromunda, and then fine, we'll talk about the bloody goldfish. Um, so House Orlock have been introduced to Necromunda. Uh, we're getting, uh, they're getting a hero, so to compensate, Escher and Goliath are getting a queen and king, respectively, along with a couple of new miniatures and a couple of new bounty hunters. And one pets. of which, as we said... Oh yes, and pets. This is true. The uh, Orlock king has a dog. Yes. Yeah, the and- Cybermastiffs. And also, um, there's also a bomb rat, like a rat with explosives. Glass get a crocodile. I should get a cat. Yeah, who, who's, it, who's it to get the bomb rat? I think it was House Delac. Because there's like a uh, pet for each house. Well, if asher has got the cat, Orlok's got the Cybermastiff. What's Goliath got? Goliath's got the crocodile. Right. And the uh, gene sealer th- cult has their little... Uh... The little guys. We're not talking about familiars. <laughs> well, uh, no, I mean, it's going to count as the same thing for them. In uh, It's what's... around the same size and everything. Yes, but I don't I think... think the familiars are stuff with explosives. Uh, they're gene stealer cult. They're... Yes, they could be. Do you think a gene stealer uh, cult would, would take... Something that looks akin to a pure strain gene stealer, which is holy to the gene stealer cult and stuff it with explosives. Especially when it's also pretty much bound to the Magus who is in charge of the cult day to day activities. Yeah, minor details. They can make more. Uh, we're just. I th- yeah, I'm going to feel. <laughs> so, about that goldfish. Same, can. Yeah, all right. Like, let's talk about the fucking goldfish. Right. <laughs> Um, this is technically Age of Sigma, so feel free to skip ahead two minutes if you really give that little much of a crap. Uh, All right, I'll see you guys in two minutes. Ah. Thanks. <laughs> uh, uh, but yes, there was a video posted on the other day of recording, which is the 16th of February, uh, simply titled Glob Glob. And it starts out very Age of sigma You've got uh, sort of this carcass of a ship, uh, and it's got like lots of watery oh, sound effects. And stuff, and you're thinking, hang on, is this dreadfully 2.0? Because that was the first thing into my mind when I saw the trailer. And then suddenly, Goldfish. I hope the Goldfish is named Duncan. Now, what upset me is that you refer to it as Dreadfully 2.0 as opposed to Man of War 3.0. Bear in mind, I've only been playing for 10 years. Man of War is before my time. Man of War's got a video barely... game out. No excuse. Yes. When was the last time I touched a video game? Uh, 2015, I think. What do you do with your free time? I don't have a games console and I own a Mac. What do you expect me to do? 
Solitaire. Buy a different computer. No. Uh, that's expensive. I'm oh, okay. Not, not as expensive that's as fair enough. <laughs> yes, but this will last a very... I, I'm not going to have this argument. <laughs> But anyway, there was a video involving a goldfish, and I apparently have no sense of history and culture. We knew this already. Yeah, no. leave it to the town and not have culture. Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping it's Man of War 3.0, but it's probably more akin to something like, I don't know, Undead Pirates or something. Well, it being a important season, it might be something to do with exactly that. Um, but so, we shall have to find out. So I have something it might to- have to do with the missing Primark... Uh, what Sigma? Oh uh, yeah, no, not Sigma. What what's the, what's the skeleton guy's name? The Gash. Yeah, there we go. The He's a little Gash. You mean the God of the Dead? Yeah, the missing Primarch, Nagash. Now we we all know it's to do with the Tau. Yeah, probably. Could you imagine that? Well, what Tau goldfish? I mean, that would be really funny. I'm okay with that. So that, that makes me think of something. We haven't actually come across any like aquatic species, pretty much, have we? Uh, like, I, I don't know. You know your xenozoology plug here better than I do. Uh, but I, I can't remember coming across many aquatic, like sentient species in 40k. Or, there's like, really only yeah. There's very really only this Harduin who haven't really been mentioned since Rogue Trader. Yeah, see also the slan, I guess. And they have a lot of fan art. Do not search for them with safe search off. I think that's just furry porn. No, it's it's them. And I wish that I never knew about that. But speaking of the slan, the slan got mentioned in one of the Horus Heresy novels. That made me so happy that Eldrad ends up having a fight with a slan. Wait, what? Yeah. In Old Earth, um, Eldred ends up meeting up with one of the Slan, who's a member of the Cabal, and ends up having a fight with him. And then sur- a surprise loyalist word bearer appears. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's many, 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 many what's associated with that. <laughs> yeah. Also, uh, Vulcan gets swallowed by a Great Unclean One, and it turns out inside the Great Unclean One is the Garden of Nurgle. That I kind of knew. And then Vulcan I... ended up killing the demon. Not banishing it, not unmaking it, killing it. I I didn't know that, but I kind of believe it. It's just something that... Just and, demons. And then, not only that, but Ferris Manus's fingers are magical. They are able to rip a hole in the fabric of reality. Very much like the Anathane blade. Or Superman. And also, um, you know how Eldred went to Fulgrim and said, yeah, I need you to just kind of stop the Horus Heresy before it starts? Yeah, apparently he went to, Ful- uh, to Ferris Manus first. Wait, what? Yep. I feel like I knew that as well. Like, I feel like I, kn- I knew that. Yeah, he went to Ferris Manus first and Ferris was, was just, nope, and walked off. Nope, and instead of killing you, I'm just going to leave. Pretty much. I mean, in all fairness, they probably could have just went up to the Primarchs and just went, we're humans. I think they'll be able to tell them apart. Eh, I mean, thousands of different human cultures, different human evolution, and the chance of breeding together. True, but at the same Probably time, how how many for a while? How many spe- um, human species do you see within 40k who are seven foot tall, very th- thin and lithe, with el- with huge pointy elf ears? The sisters of silence, and uh, they don't have elf ears. We don't know that yet. If we do, yeah, we've had bare headed sister models. I know. I'm just yeah. I got nothing on that one. <laughs> yeah, but they are seven foot tall. Yes, and Eldar tend to have you know eyes that are frequently unnatural in human color. Yeah. Still, with the vast majority of human evolution and everything on different worlds and different adaptations, and plus they, they could have Primarchs lied for at least fourteen seconds. And plus, the Primarchs would have had you know experience with you know 
Eldari, Drukari, and all that during well, the Great actually, Crusade. Well, actually, didn't didn't really have any fights with them. Apart from the fight with Eldrad. Well, yeah, but up until that point, he didn't know about them. But, yeah, there's not many but, records of Eldari yeah. Imperial conflict in that time. There's not many, if any. Keep in mind that the Eldar actually stayed to some of the furthest points in the galaxy at that time, and most Space Marine Legions didn't know about them. Yeah, I mean, and to be fair, that was pretty much straight after the whole Slanesh business, and the only Eldari that had survived the fall were those on the furthest flung craft worlds, or in the webway, i.e. Comera. Yes, but at the same time, a lot of the Space Marine homeworlds were actually being raided by Drukhari. The Nocturne was True. raided constantly, Chikoros was raided. Drukhari also attacked Angron on Nuceria. Yes. Funny th- funny story as well, like Angron and Lorgar both teamed up to beat the shit out of a Drukhari prince. That's just overkill. And that is just yeah, the yeah, most insane. That was when Lorgar realised that Angron was going to become a demon prince because the Drukhari was like, he must not become the blood god's son. And Lorgar was Drukhari. like, oh, hello. I like you now, brother. Yeah, and I mean, that's that was why they tried to kill him right at the very beginning, I think, was to do with that. Uh, that was the initial attack on Angron on, on New Zaria was to do with that, I think. Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting little story. Have you got any more little new story tidbits to throw at us while we're here? Uh, yes, how about the time that Ferris Manus, on his flagship, got into a fight with a... A human the size of a dread knight. <laughs> what? It was okay, a... look, see, and then you. No, let, let me finish. Let, let me that... finish. Let me finish. It was a biomechanical human, so it wasn't pure human. I was going to say. Is yeah, and um, it's the most powerful of these of the high lords of the Gardenal civilization. He was like, "I am going to destroy you," and first man's leash just goes. I doubt it. <laughs> And then smashes him in with his hammer. Yeah, that sounds pretty much like Manus. Oh, but um, this is the weird bit. This High Lord of the Cardinal, he shot like a las cannon beam at Ferris Manus, and Manus catches the las beam and crushes it. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a physicist. Fuck you. No. That is not how light works, motherfucker. I'm just going to say ma- okay, magical me, me- necron metal. All right, let me let me try to justify this in a way. He could have used latent psychic energy to create a field around it which distorted reality and thus caught it and then shattered it. It's yeah. light. Ma- magical it's... necron space metal. Now, if it was plasma, then okay, living metal shenanigans. Well, but it's actually, literally high-energy light. In all fairness, Necrons do have the technology to snuff out light from its source. So again, magical Necron space metal. Yeah, you gotta remember, this is an entire universe where they op- a spaceship can open up a portal to hell to travel a, a different point in reality. Yes, but... The Necron technology that can do that finally exists. Manus literally had his hands accidentally covered in living metal. Was no... it an accident, though? Or did the Void Dragon really just choose him? Even though it's more likely to be a Count Tick Tomb Stalker. Still. Regardless, through luck, shenanigans, and whatever, his hands were just covered in living metal. That's it. Well, he put his hands inside of a volcano while strangling a giant Necron thingamajig, which then infused upon his flesh. Oh. We don't know what technology was put underneath his flesh. And did you know that Ferris's Banister's hands can change temperature? That they can actually boil? <sighs> you know what? I'm just not going to argue. And at this point, Manus is just anti law of physics and just <laughs> fine stuff it. Let's put this way. He was so powerful, he was the reason why he needed to be the first to die. Because he was too powerful. 
All right, so from what I'm getting, if somebody shot a LAS cannon at him, he could catch it and then Kamehameha it back at its target. Which admittedly would be kind of awesome to see in a, in a Primark novel. It would be kind of awesome, let's be honest. I'm... You just just think about that for a second, like... He'll just go full-on Zeus on people, just throw lightning wait. bolts at people. It was Fulgrim that killed him, right? Yes. Okay, because I always get uh, him and Perturabo confused. But anyway... Fulgrim tried to kill both of them, for the record. I know, that's why I get them confused. But uh, he's standing there, and he's just like, No, you're not even worth my blade. He fires a Laz cannon at him. He catches it and just Kamehameha's it back at freaking Fulgrim. And Fulgrim just laughs it off because he's a Primarch and they don't care. Which leads me up to another point. Yeah, apparently. Right, so you know how Robledorn lost his hand? You know, it's the only part of him recovered by the chapter. Yeah? Yeah. Well, okay. hand, yeah. hand, uh, well, you're about to contradict that, aren't you? His hand would have grown back by now. Because, in reflection cracked, Fabius Bile takes a blowtorch to Fulgrim's foot, melts his foot off, and it grows back a few minutes later. Very much yep. the reflection crack that was possessed full. No, no, he wasn't. Pos- he wasn't possessed at this point. As was post, not quite. A- oh yeah, actually, yeah, no, no, you're right, you're right, you're right. Uh, he'd overturned it by the time of the reflection crack. Sorry, yeah. I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, that's that's fine. The only question then is, well, did he survive at all? I'm going to say no, because we can't have. Let's be honest. I know it's going to be an unpopular opinion, but we can't have every loyalist Primarch still being alive. I'm all right with, like, say, two or three, but any more than that would probably be a bit too much for modern day. But of those two or three, I mean, you have Gillum and Lion, and Dawn is that third. I wouldn't, I'd take Dawn over Khan or Korax. I like Khan and Korax. I, I would take Khan. I would take Khan as well, just because he'd be so different in regards to. Not only his appearance, but also his personality, because Dawn and Gilliman would be a bit too similar in appearance and ideology, I feel, in Monday 40k. You know, True. Lion's still got the whole, you know, secrecy of the fall and that thing, so he's got that air of, you know, you know. Well, I was going to say air of mystery, but that's probably not the right word, but you know what I mean. Yeah. So, that, yeah. so Khan being, like, for lack of a better term, the noble savage, as it were. As compared, to, uh, as opposed to Lehman Russ being, you know, the drunken savage. Is it bad that I'm thinking of him coming out of Kimura on his jet bike, like all half Eldar, half Imperial technology, face painted white, silver across his mouth, just we are war boys, and just flying out. And Gillum is just like, uh, what? <laughs> are you suggesting that Jack Khan is actually Immortal Joe? Yes. In all fairness, that would be awesome. Also, we completely forgot to mention Vulcan. Oh yeah, Vulcan's back. Woo! Vulcan's back? No, I was I was meaning for this like hypothetical who would be the third one we wanted back. Nobody mentioned Vulcan. Nobody wants Vulcan back except for Salamander fans. Vulcan already came back. He had his chance. They fucked off again. <laughs> nah, point taken. I think we need a, a Remley sound effect for their, like what he did when he fucked off. He died. Was, well, he, went he sort of died. He got vaporized. Well, yeah, Celestine. I always say sort of died with Vulcan because perpetual question mark. Mm. I mean, I kind of like the fact that it's perpetual question mark and not just perpetual. Like, the whole stuff with uh, John Grammaticus actually makes it at least intriguing as to whether he's actually alive. Oh. Oh, uh, apparently Guy Haley's new book coming out, um, Murdered Lady, uh, which focuses on the Sisters of Battle, has Celestine in it again. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. She keeps coming back. And that is, is that her order? Yeah, I think that's her order. It is her order. I thought it was. Oh. Before we go into that, I just want to point one more thing about Old Earth. Um, Vulcan actually made it to Terra. Before wait, the wait, scene. Wait, wait. Yeah, Old Earth ends with him at 
you know, in the Imperial Palace talking to Rogal Dawn, and it's like, who else is here? Oh, the Khan's here somewhere. And also, you know how in TTS Vulcan's like, let me hug your brother. Yeah, that's canon now. Cause, like, oh, God. There you go. He's like, Dawn, it's good to see you. May I embrace you, brother? Oh, and that's then amazing. Dawn, then Dawn just looks at him funny, and then they hug. Oh, no. <laughs> Great. <laughs> In fairness, if any other problems this. are going to be huggy, it's going to be Vulcan. I, I can't exactly imagine Lorgar being very cuddly, except for maybe some of the you know, those young aspirants, maybe. You know, choir boy joke here. Um, whoa, 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 that's very better. Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm glad I'm not the one that went there. So if Vulcan... Okay, let, let, let's, put, let's put that aside for a second and come back to the fact that Vulcan made it to cocking Terra. At what so, Did you just say cocking Terra? Yep. Deal with it. <laughs> Hang so, on. <laughs> okay, continue. So, right, timeline. Khan gets back to Terra. Yes. At some point. I, I forget exactly at what point. But it's pre-Solar War, I know that. At some point between then and the end of the Ruined Storm and the arrival of the Blood Angels, Vulcan turns up. Yes. What? the hell happens after that? Where the hell did the salamanders go? In fairness, there's only him and three salamanders who made it to Terra. But still, like, why wouldn't he be involved in the defense? He's, it's literally the cradle of humanity. He's on the home world. Even if it was just to go to the vengeful spirit, he'd do I'm, something. I'm more concerned about the f- fact that according to the upcoming, um, the upcoming horror series novel, which has Russ versus Horus, Russ oh, makes yeah, well, it to Terra and then fucks off. Actually, I do think that's a thing because Russ coordinate sort of not coordinated, but worked closely with the Knights Errant, and that in turn involved working with Malkador, most likely. And the easiest way to do that was for him to be on Terra. I think I get. I feel like I knew that he went to Terra, and then he bugs off to try and kill Horus. It's like. Can you imagine what the Siege of Terra would have been like if you had Lehman Russ and the Space Wolves on Terra as well? Yeah, have we got like, the a Salamanders date versus um, Fulgrim's Emperor's Children? Like, I could see Vulcan actually protecting like the entirety of the Hab blocks and everything. In first, that might be what they end up doing. Maybe like Vulcan just ends up doing a one-man wrecking crew of Emperor's Children preying upon the civilians. Which that would, would that- work. Because we don't know what Vulcan himself did during the Siege of Terror itself. We just know that because of the Shattered Legions, you know, they weren't actually... The Legions weren't there. Yeah. Could you, uh, yeah. Could you imagine the writers from Black Library actually watch this and they're just like, oh crap, we made another consistency error. Let's just listen to what they have to say and do that. <laughs> so let's be sensible then and come up with something good. Vulcan ends up having a huge fucking punch up with Fulgrim in the middle of a civilian hab block. Like, Vulcan just grabs Fulgrim by the tail and starts swinging him around, smashing him through buildings like, you know, like someone swinging a shot put or something. <laughs> that would be a cool visual, you have to admit. That would be a very cool visual. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, do we have a like a date for Wolfsbane? Sorry, just returning to that. It so is we have in like a, a, not, um, uh, May, I believe. Sorry, I should be clear. Not a release date in our world, as in a date oh, in, sorry. in the timeline. So that's my fault. I wasn't clear. Is it, is it, do we know where it is in the timeline? Uh, before the Siege of Terror. That's all we really know at this point Fair in time. Enough. Yeah, because obviously the Space Wars got very, 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 very fucked in the Horus Heresy between... Prospero and the Alaxis Nebula and Urant, it was not good for the Space Wars in the Horus Heresy, so yeah, I'm curious. Yeah, they did better than the, you know, the Raven Guard, who ended up having, what, 5,000 guys left? Yeah. And that was before the Siege of Terror? Which they weren't at. No. But they were still fucked. Yeah, that's a very fair point. 
I mean, the Iron Hands actually had more surviving troops. They just lost the Primark. Yeah, and I think I, I think I know who'd be, probably be happier with the end result of the drop site massacre if you could apply such a thing. We've got more men, but they've got a Primark. Yeah. So yeah, I think the Iron Hands were the big losers. Well, to be fair, the Salamanders were absolutely shattered, and Vulcan was missing. So maybe the Salamanders had it even worse. Mm. They believed Vulcan was dead. Then he came back. Then he disappeared again. Yeah. Then he came it, back, and then he disappeared again. Yeah, just, just. I, I really want to make a terrible joke, but I'm not going to. That's the first. Is it going to be something along the lines of "Where in the warp is the Primarch Vulcan"? No, it was something much, much, much darker and worse. Right. Okay, we're moving on then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Even I won't make that that joke. You mean it's worse than, <laughs> than the Lord Bar Choir Boy joke? Alright, it's not that bad, but still, I won't make that joke. Probably for the best. For all concerned. And Pretty another much. story related news, I made the mistake of reading a Goto story and my head hurts now. <laughs> we have the, um, the chaplain and a jump pack dual wielding a heavy flamer and a multi melter. Scouts using attack bikes. The Angel Sanguine's homeworld being Baal, even though, you know, that's Blood Angel's territory. Yep. Wrong. Uh, Just, well, okay, I think I can defend the Baal thing in that they're sort of, they're not physical homeworld. Their physical homeworld is, I forget the name of the planet right now, but their spiritual home is Baal. They were recruiting from Baal. And now I I, th- I think he confused the Angel Sanguine for the Blood Angels. Yeah, I d- it, perhaps. Yeah, it was kind of painful to read. I mean, granted, it hasn't got you know the multi laser land raiders, you know, or the Razorback turning into a land raider, and you know, and all that jazz. Which is something, I suppose. Yeah, if it just set your standards before you go in, I suppose. It's like watching a Michael Bay movie. You know it's bad. Yes, but even Michael Bay has made some good movies now and again. You know, like Bad Boys or Pain and Gain. Those were actually good. Yeah, I, I'll ch- do I, that. Ch- I challenged someone to name a Goto book that was actually good. That's a challenge for anyone listening. And no one will take me up on that because no one's stupid enough to read a Goto book. I don't know. There are some stupid people out there. But anyway. Yeah, probably anyway. best we don't take that line anyway. any further. Uh, in one, full, uh, one final little bit of news, uh, Cal Jericho is back again. Along with Mad Donna Ulanti. Yes, uh, they've been on pre-order on way to order before, and they're back again, which is lovely. No, I am uh, upset it's not the original Cal Jericho model from Black Library, because that was a better sculpt, in my opinion. So, though, speaking of Black Library... Yes. Um, it'll be this Saturday, by the time this video goes live. Uh, it is going to be the Black Library celebration thingy McJib, and hey. I barely know the details. Basically, for that special day, for that one day, Saturday the 24th, you can go into a Games Workshop and you can buy an Eisenhorn model. For that one day. Yeah. Wait, the Eisenhorn model? Yep. He's not going to be... He's coming out in three more months and he won't be exclusive. No, according to the information No, uh, according to my distributor, he is not a unique model. He's kind of like the canon ass. In which case... Short pro- time... In which case, it'll be an early release on that day and a wider release later down the line. Yep, that's exactly what they're doing. To be fair, that sounds like a sort of typical operating protocol because we see that quite a lot. With like, Here's something you can get if you come to X event and then it'll be out later for everybody else. Yep, so I pre-ordered mine. 
To be fair, I think when was the last time that we had a like actual timed exclusive miniature or like event exclusive miniature? Because the last one I can think of are the games day models. Mm. Yeah, pretty much just the game day models. I still I mean, have I yeah. still have my games day uh, Gorkonorkonot knob from games day nineteen ninety seven. So you're, you're what games workshop? The games day Gorkonorka knob. Right. Okay. Sorry. It's a, it's, it's a bit yeah, of a tongue okay, twister. I can't tell what you said there. But it's the one yeah. that's um, based on the artwork for that other book, which is in the box set. Because you've got the rules and that other book, which is all the background information. That That is amazing. That's perfect. Gorka Morka was awesome. We need, to, we need to have that come back. And not just have Gorkas and Morkas. We need, to have, we need to have the Gorkas, back. Morkas, the Rebel Grots, the Diggers, and the Muties. To be fair, I mean, people were harping to get Necromunda back, and we got Necromunda back and then some. Yeah. So what will be the next specialist game, I wonder? Because obviously... The Titanicus. BF... Epic by another name, essentially. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Epic. But then Battlefleet Gothic, That they surely they'll capitalise on the popularity of the games, the video games, with Battlefleet Gothic. They have to. I... I do want to say something. The Battlefleet Gothic game is not that popular. It is one of my... It is my hands-down favorite Games Workshop game, but it is not that popular. As in not popular doesn't sell or people don't like it? Not popular didn't have good sales. But then it's a 40k game. But in the relative scheme of things, 40k games don't sell well. Yep. And that's the net Look at Dawn of War 3. Yeah, but I feel like the fact that the community that does play Battlefleet Gothic really, really likes it, and it is very well done. Generally, the I, funny Alex thing is, going is to me up. I'm like, sorry, I'm sorry. I gotta, I gotta interrupt really quickly. The community that plays Battlefleet Gothic still is my channel. <laughs> That's it. The funny thing is, in regards to tabletop, Battlefleet Gothic's already had three editions. If you count, you know, Space Fleet as the original. You know, Necromunda's had two editions. She had, no, three editions now. Because you had Necromunda, Necromunda, Underhive, and Necromunda 3.0. Which is also called Underhive. Yep. Gorkamorg has only ever had the one edition. Space Hulk's had four, I think? Three. Just the third edition got re-released, like, about three times. Yeah, you're right. right. The one thing I did like about the original Space Hulk is you actually got box set expansions. Yeah, there was a Deathwing one, wasn't there? Deathwing and Gene Stealer with new models and new floor tiles and new missions and stuff. That was awesome. Because you had those little adorable Rogue Trader era plastic Terminator librarians. Yeah. They were cute. Rogue Trader Terminators were fucking adorable. Because they looked like they were made from marshmallow. If you look at the unpainted yeah. model, you actually see what I mean because they look like like someone's carved a little marshmallow. Fair play, fair play. But yeah, we need yeah, more Gorkamorka. But going back to when Alexis mentioned Dawn of War three briefly, uh, that's been abandoned. Yes, yeah, kind that... of how I predicted it would. Yes. So. So when but, I haven't really looked into, this. I know it's happened, but I haven't really looked into. It. When you say abandoned, you, you mean they are not supporting that particular game, or they've ditched the license. Not supporting the game anymore. So no, none of the planned expansions are going to happen. No more updates. Nothing. It's dead in the water. And it's potentially. I don't know if it has killed Dawn of War dead, but um, there is still won't. a huge. Com- community that plays Dawn of War, so there is likely to be another game in the works soon. It's just that more soon people, I mean in the next ten years. It's just that more people are playing Soulstorm than Dawn of War three. Yeah, and it's because of Ultimate Apocalypse. And the guy that's working on Ultimate Apocalypse and this I don't know for sure, but is also working on an apocalypse mode for Dawn of War two. Exactly. Also, unpopular opinion, I prefer Dawn of War 2 to Dawn of War 1. I like Dawn of War 2. I liked uh, both of the... I liked 
Dawn of War 1 and Dawn of War 2, respectively. I don't consider them in the same game series um, because they're, they're radically different games. Yeah, they're a continuation of the same canon, but they're a completely different genre. Yeah, and I think they both did fairly well for what they were. Yeah, because yeah. they made the Blood Ravens thieves like crazy. I've actually. Go on. Because Dawn of War 1 was your standard, you know, base building up um, RTS like StarCraft or Command and Conquer. Dawn of War 2 was more of an, a strategy action RPG type feel. And then Dawn of War 3 fucked up by trying to combine both of them at the same time along with making it like a MOBA. Yeah, they, they tried to copy League of Legends and it was bad. Yeah, that, that was the first fucking yeah. mistake, you know, copying that piece of shit. Yeah, the only Dawn of War I've actually played is Dark Crusade. I've not played any of the rest, um, but I've been looking into the Blood Ravens and trying to follow the continuity of Dawn of War 1 and 2 and fit it all together. Like, when you actually take a step back and think, if this wasn't a video game and this was just a, the plot of a story, by God, some of it's ridiculous. The only good thing about Dawn of War 3 was the tie-in comic series where they made little jokes in regards to some of the stupider things in Dawn of War. It's like, hey, who was your commander? Oh, Bori. I was like, oh, yeah. You, you that, that, I'm not even talking about Dawn of War 3. <laughs> oh, I'm kind of talking about Dawn of War 3, but like Gabriel Angelo should have been shot in the head by the Inquisition before the end of Dawn of War 1. Yep. Hey, the amount the Blood Ravens get away with in the con- Continuity of if you follow who, who won Soulstorm by the way was it the Orcs? Uh, yeah, Gorgots won. Yeah, canonically Gorgots won. But yeah, when you look at who if you follow the continuity of Dawn of War one through three and look at like what the Blood Ravens get away with, particularly in Dark Crusade, it's yeah they get get away with a lot of stuff that realistically only the first founding legions could afford to get away with. Also, on a side note, the Tau Commander in Dawn of War Dark Crusade is not the same guy from Fire Warrior. And we're not sure if he's the same guy from Farsight. No. I think think he is. I think the Dark Crusade guy and the guy in the Farsight Enclave's supplement are the same person. But I can't confirm that. Because when it describes OK Sokais in the Vata Enclave supplement, he is a monad. He is a lone fighter. He's a one-man army. And that's kind of how the Dawn of War Tau Commander operates. He's a one-man killing machine. And then he's got Shadow Sun's armor for no good reason. Um, so they could be one and the same. But yes, it's not the same person as Fire Warrior. I liked Fire Warrior. That was a thing. That was a game. It was a thing. I'm not sure how to <laughs> take the novel, you know. But that being said, when people say that, yeah, it's never been Chaos Towers, like, apart from that one time when Kai started screaming blood for the blood god, but hey. Yeah, and then you just point them at Crisis of Faith and say, um, I, I'm i waiting. Zinch Tau, Zinch Tau. Yeah, I... I don't, have we had any sort of like whisperings on what the release order is for these three new Xenos codices? Uh, do we know like which one's going to be first? Um, because I can't. I just want the Tau one to come out, not for rules reasons. Obviously, I'm a Tau player, so I'm biased. But just for law reasons, like there's more questions with them perhaps than anybody else. Not that I'm aware of. Then again, Alexis might know because of a distributor. I actually have not gone into this. We've been doing a lot of inventory lately, so I didn't have time to check the orders with them or see if I can get any hints or anything. That's fine. It was just a curiosity as to whether we I'm did I'm uh... kind of hoping it's Dukari first. I can see that. Um, is that for rule reasons, law reasons, or both? I really like the Dukari. That's fine. That's completely fine. Also, I want them to touch up on um, Yagatai Khan. Actually, that'll be interesting as to whether the new Jakari Codex is to how... Well, obviously, the Homunculi 
boys in their own thing, but whether Himunculae Did we just lose Michael? There's a... So you just went completely silent for a few seconds. Oh, right, sorry. Uh, Last I heard was homunculi. Right. Well, the homunculus had their own supplement in 7th edition, and I'm not expecting they'll get that again. But because of the fact that we have the Cabals, the Cults, and the Covens in Drakari, that's going to be one hell of a lot of faction rules that they'll have to squeeze into one book. So is there an argument for saying that because of their separatism from the Yanari, they'll get their own book? The Yanari? Yeah, the homunculi and the Yanari. The Yanari are definitely going to get their own codex. I'm meaning, like, oh, are the homunculi going to be in the Drakari codex? Because there's only so much space they have to fit the cabals and cults in, and if you're trying to work out who's allied with who, it is easier to put the homunculi in their own codex so if they don't have any issue with the Drakari Codex and the Yanari and stuff. I think they will be in the Drakari Codex, just because if you take out the homunculi, what really do the Drakari have left? Apart from the witch, witch cults and the incubi. It's and got, the cabals. They just have really, just really like cool warriors. They got the stuff, dark raids. I mean, they'd have to flesh out the actual current Drakari roster to make it happen. I know that. But it was just something that made me think. Like, if they, because they're either going to have to really gimp the amount of cabals and cults and covers they put in one book to about two or three of each. Maybe only two, because most armies get about six traits, chapter tactics, thing in which jibs. So to keep that in line, they can only really have a maximum of three per faction, which is less than all the other armies get. It was just something that was on my mind that made me think, I don't know, probably not. Less than all of the other chapters get. When did we start talking about the Custodians? Oh, that, yeah, that codex was just, what, 10 pages long? I know I'm exaggerating. Pages. It was it was anemic compared to the other codices. Although I do find this funny, and I, I think uh, Remlays would be like, what the hell? All right, so you know how in the codex itself, um, the, 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 the cipher escaped, and the custodians are actually after him, using the Sisters of Silence to like, go forward and push through every, everything that he's trying to throw at them. Right. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. Rules as written, I could take Cypher and have him lead my custodian army. Oh, yes, I remember you saying. I think you brought that up last week. Last time. I know, but I still find that really funny. I mean, yeah, the the study, I'll get... Sorry, go on. There you go. On. I was just going to say that we are getting the Forge World Custodes rules that are going to be bunking out that codex. But yeah, that that's really stuff help. that they should have already included in the codex. Sorry. And plus, in regards to the whole rules as written thing, you got to get, you're going to get into arguments as rules as intended, that kind of thing. Yeah. The fact that you can move your barrel and take a shot from your barrel that's pointed all the way up in the air, and then your opponent can't call line of sight on it because it's not part of the hull. Yeah, there's there's a lot to Eighth Edition that you could. You could be a jerk about. Yeah, it it's a very good edition. It is a really good edition, eighth edition, but it allows some silliness. Really, I was going to say scumminess, but, but yes, I'm going to go works. with silliness. Mostly because I use some of those scummy tactics. I mean, <laughs> I, well, I don't. I totally do, but I want to say silly so I don't sound as bad. <laughs> yeah, I have no such because I barely play at all, so I'm calling it scummy. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, 8th edition is great. It just has... It's just it's designed for a different group of people, I think. Maybe. I think it's designed for more newcomers. It's a very easy edition to learn. That's true. That's very true. It's That's always been its primary selling point. Is it Well, not primary, but one of its big selling points is its pick-up-and-play nature. Also, have you guys also noticed in regards to this edition, there's a lot of throwbacks, like a lot of callbacks and Easter eggs to much older editions. 
in regards to things in the law. And oh, stuff. Yeah. Well, I actually, I have a theory about that and why they're doing that. So last edition, the president of Games Workshop was god awful. Okay, I'm not going to go into detail on that, but he tried to push for all new players and everything. This edition seems like it's more complimenting the older players. And it's like, hey, you guys have been playing long enough. You'll know what this is. And we're going to give you little tidbits in the lore that have never been answered. And I really like that about what they're doing now. But at the same time, the game is still extremely accessible to those new players. So, Oh, yeah, without doubt. And it's the best-selling um, it's the best selling edition since, like, 5th, I think. That doesn't surprise me. I think mean, fifth has got a lot of nostalgia love on its side. Like fifth is, ex- I think fifth is probably the most popular edition. I <laughs> sorry, it was fifth. <laughs> what fifth, did I say now? So, sorry, saying that fifth has a lot of nostalgia value to someone who's been playing since second. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it just tickled me. <laughs> Where do you get tickled? Wouldn't you like to know? Oh. Go away with that. I. Yeah. All right. Moving on. Yeah. Just, just, just drop it. Um, but yeah, like, to be fair though, like, yes, I know what you're saying about nostalgia and fifth edition, which is now it's a decade since fifth edition got released. It's a decade. Like, that doesn't make place as an old man. Yeah. I, to be honest, that I doesn't make quite make me feel old, but it makes me realize quite how long I've been in this hobby. Like, my oh. my edition came out in 1993. I was three years old. I was three years off being born. Yeah. Remley's you old. Yeah, I know I'm old. <laughs> I, I, I still I still remember the days where you can go and buy a copy of Space Hawk from Argos. Yeah. Alexis probably doesn't know what Argos is. I do know what Argos is. <laughs> okay, guys. Yeah. I, but I, I'm still like sitting here, like, uh. yeah. I still, I still remember when Games Workshop used to make their models out of lead. Jesus. And so, like, yeah, in, the, in the back of White Dwarf, you had like the little catalog page at the end where you had like um, all the pictures of the models, and at the end, uh, right at the bottom of the tiniest print, I was like, these are made of lead and can be harmful if chewed or swallowed. Don't fuck about with them. And that was back when you could literally order any mo- any part of any model that had ever been made. Yeah. You literally, like, phone up the games workshop and say, I'm looking for this spear for a Skaven clan rat and that was released in 1992. Can you get me one? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so everybody in the comments, leave your nostalgic comments about your favourite edition from the past, <laughs> whether you're an, a newbie hipster like me or an old fart like Ramblies. Because everyone so, knows so that's the second... So am I the second... middle ground? Age-wise, everyone... yes, you are the middle ground. Yay! You just don't have the glory, the honour and the glory of having played through second edition. Or Hero Hammer, as it was known. To be fair, I, the, I did... I was given the fourth edition rulebook by the person who I think someone gave me or sold me half a battle from a crag. I never used the Terranids, but it had the fourth edition rulebook. Um, and I remember reading through the fourth edition rulebook and being utterly baffled by it. My favorite thing was blast markers. When they hit something, they had different values. Uh, oh, fourth edition was amazing. How about armor penetration dice rolls? We have to do like D6 plus 10 plus D20 plus D4. Or or sustained fire dice. That was a classic. So we had weapons like a storm bolter. Roll sustained fire dice. That tells you how many shots you got. Or if it jammed, you didn't get to shoot. And the glorious one, the assault cannon. Three sustained fire dice. If you rolled three jams, your weapon blows up and he's dead. Effect, yeah. Fourth edition would look like a confusing son of a gun, especially compared to fifth. Like fifth feels to fourth, like what? Well, not quite what eighth does to seventh, which was just a generic fix. But yeah, 
Did no, you know? it wasn't a fix. It was they took 7th edition and threw it out the window because it was bad. 7th no, edition I mean... for 40k and not 30k. 30k is actually balanced because of the, t- the armies that fight each other. Or the lack therein. This is and... what I don't understand in regards to people who complain about 8th edition. It's like, oh, it's different. It's like, big deal. 1st edition was different from 2nd, which was different from 3rd. Each edition was completely different back in them days. Grow the fuck up. Yeah, I mean, even like 4 to 5 was a big... A lot of things changed 4 to 5. 5 to 6 was a reasonable change. 6 to 7 was literally 7 was 6.5 and just as broken. And then we got 8th. Now, it wasn't just as broken. They gave us formations, which broke the game even more. Wasn't that in 6th? That was 7th. Okay. Formations are what broke seventh edition. I could just hold there in sixth. Or maybe that's just apocalypse. My bad. It's better. The other good thing that eighth has done is it's given all the old expansions a new lease on life, like Apocalypse, Planet Strike, Stronghold of Soul. Like Although, I do like that nobody is using those rules. They're like, let's play Apocalypse, but instead of using the GW rules, let's just use the eighth edition rules and. And just go above the power levels. Or points, depending. I do really want to play Planet Strike soon. I, I think that's one of the games I really want to play. Planet Strike always looked fun. So it's something I really do want to play. It is pretty oh, fun. I just remembered. Back in my day of second edition, went to Games Workshop oh, no. to play... Um, this is before I had the run-in with the cunt of a Games Workshop manager. This is when I had a different manager who's actually a cool dude. That was 35 episodes ago. Nobody remembers. They remember it. Anyway. <laughs> um, incidentally, this, this particular cool manager had his army featured in White Dwarf, but that's a different issue. We were playing a... Um, it was like a weekend open game. Chaos versus Eldar. And it was basically based on the Ranabandra. That was the scenario. So basically just bring, as much, just bring as much as you can, right? And yet, yeah. the Eldar... You're only allowed one avatar... Okay, chaos. They're allowed twelve bloodthirsters. Fuck off. <laughs> well, it's supposed to be when insurmountable the, odds. Because this is back when we had the um, the second iteration of the metal bloodthirster model. Uh, that must have been the worst assembly ever. Oh yeah, you you, you had <laughs> to drill pin the wings together, otherwise it would not stay together. Because you only That's had no about surprise. because you had about two millimeters of <laughs> thing of gap to fill. But Contact. anyway, yeah, that's it. But yeah, they had like twelve blood versus. We're only allowed one avatar. And it's like, I mean, yes, we got thirty five Falcon Grav tanks, but still <laughs> thirty five Falcons. Because this, this wasn't long after the Grav tank got released in plastic. So Cause everybody it, had one. Yeah, because at that point, um, before then, the Falcon Grav Tank did not actually have a model. In fact, it didn't actually have rules in the um, Eldar Codex. It was exclusively in White Dwarf. Uh, take that for what you will. Um, but yeah, everyone had one. Yeah, I was the only one who had a different weapon set because everyone had the um, the Laz Cannon and Scatter Laser. But I was the only one who had Laz Cannon and Plasma Gun. Or Heavy Plasma Gun. So, yeah, welcome to an edition when people hadn't come up with unique weapon names. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, this was this was back when orcs were ballistic skill three. Oh. That must have been insane. But at the same time, they were only weapon skill three as well. Oh, that's just wrong. It, that's wrong. Yeah, I mean, stat stat wise. They were basically the same as humans, except one point higher in toughness and one point lower in initiative. That was it. That's just oh wrong. God. Yeah. And back when you had the Gazgol Thraka model, who looked like an angry Russian. <laughs> yep. With an arm with no elbow whatsoever. Yeah. Good, good times. Good times. Also, that was the time when we actually had a Nasdrag model, like an official Nasdrag model. 
when he didn't use a plasma a heavy plasma gun, he used a uh, heavy bolter. I have his model sitting around somewhere. It was big power fist. No power claw, power fist. Yep. Yep. Welcome to the edition where people hadn't come up with original names yet. Yeah. <laughs> and the Legion of the Damned were a special character. Oh, I re- yes, I do know that. Like, I, I, that well, that's been going straight over my head for the last five minutes. But yeah, I do remember that uh, when the Legion of the Damned got their re-release in fifth, fifth, sixth. Fifth, I think. Uh, I remember them talking about how the Legion of the Damned used to work. Yeah. And then in White and they Dwarf... they had their named character, didn't they? Uh, Sergeant Centurius, who was only available at Games Day, yeah. That was it. And then in White Dwarf, they decided, hey, we'll give you an entire Legion of the Damned army. Then again, White Dwarf... Take it away. Then again, White Dwarf also had an entire Death Company army. Which has definitely been retconned out of existence. That just doesn't happen anymore. They actually did a very nice way of explaining that. Like, on either battle, they're preparing for battle, and then one Marine starts suffering the vision to another, and another, and it's affecting everyone so fast that the chaplains can't keep up, and eventually they're overcome as well. And the point is, like, there's no time to paint everyone in, in the black and red. They just succumb and charge. Yeah, I mean, there's nobody to do it. They're all gone. Exactly. That was fun. Fair enough. Yeah, no, that, no, that actually makes sense. It's not as ba- not as broken as um, in third edition before the Chaos Codex came out with the Thousand Suns Terminators immune to strength four or less weapons. So they yeah. were so they were immune yeah. to bolters, las guns, yeah, also, shooters. Remember in fourth edition, uh, strength four weapons couldn't hurt a Carnifex. Well, toughness was the Carnifex back then. Eight. To be fair, four hasn't been able to wound eight ever. Uh, four couldn't wound eight in sixth or seventh. I'm pretty sure Would it could it? in sec in second at least because you have to roll a six. Um, I, I feel like uh, when did when did it fall oh, off? No, was it no, double or was it more than double? No, I I tell you what it was because in second they allowed you to roll for over seven. So if you need to roll a seven, you roll you had to roll a six first, and then you had to roll a second dice to beat that score. Yeah, that was how they handled. Uh, oh, actually, no, that's how they handled hit rolls of weapon of uh, being by like, having a hit roll of seven plus uh, or a ballistic skill of seven in uh, fantasy. That's how they handle it. Hmm. And forty k. Actually, that's how they did forty k too. And the best thing about second edition when Terminators had a three plus save on two dice. Oh, jeez, that came back in shot war. But but that being said, you know that was also when a last cannon had a minus nine save modifier. So even then you were on a twelve. Jesus. Or was it minus six? Good match. Your fingers minus six. But even so, still would okay. get to roll nine. Yeah, that's that's not the easiest thing in the world. But yes, I think we've uh, we've nostalgied it up plenty there. So should we move on? Do the questions. Yes. So let us do this. Right. Question. Does Cypher have a secret pen in his pocket that he draws doors in the air and walks through like in the cartoons? <laughs> um, so, like, like I'm going to take the silliness of that question, but I'm going to answer it as though it was a real question. Cypher might actually know webways that the Eldar themselves don't know. Alternatively, he could have an anathame blade because Alanius Pius had one. He cut doorways in the fabric of reality and walked through them. Yep. Okay. Or he's just Wily Coyote. Whatever. Wily plot device. <laughs> If the Emperor returns, will he come back as the same or a different person? I'm sure he com- on- Sorry. The only thing I can think of the Emperor coming back as would be like, he'd still be on the Golden Throne, but he would summon in an avatar of himself. Like Imperius? Yeah. 
Yeah, because I mean, I mean, he still can't leave the Golden Throne. There's literally no one else who can power the thing. Okay. Will the Sahar doing return? Well, we saw that straight up with the goldfish, so I'm going to say yes. Yeah, more than likely. Why not? What would happen if a civil war starts in Ultramar? That would be interesting, and I think that the um, current lore is going that direction. Yeah, it depends on if you want to say that Kalgar is going to rebel against Gilliman. Um, I I it's, don't think they're going to do that. I mean, Dark Imperium did drop some hints towards it. Yeah, but they, I, I don't think that they would go so far as to turn pretty much the former poster boy into a bad guy against the new poster boy. I, I just can't see them doing it. Like it's a, nice, it's a nice thing to tease to make people think, ooh, ooh, intrigue. And just it's not, oh, everything's fine and dandy under Gilliman. But I can't see them actually going through with it and pulling the trigger on it. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time they killed off, you know, a pretty big character. I mean, you had Captain Tycho of the Blow Angels. They killed him off in third edition. Not by turning him on Dante, though. They sent so, him to the Death Company. Yeah, which is still, you know, a pretty big deal. Like he he, he fell under the influence of the of the Black Rage. That's still a pretty big oh, yeah. deal. Big deal, but there's a difference between changing a character's, uh, particularly his the Blood Angels, having them fall to the floor, which can happen, and literally turning them traitor. It's a bit of a difference. I don't think it would be traitor, like. like actual traitor traitor like falling to chaos you more like a renegade at that point the imperium wouldn't differentiate it just doesn't differentiate uh, i don't know i'll have to see if they do go down that road that road i would love to see how the book uh portrays it okay Will Lorgar worship Malice and spread his influence? Lorgar worships Chaos Undivided, so technically yes. Yeah. Uh, are there demons of corn who represent tranquil fury as opposed to unstoppable rage? More than likely, but there's none that are named. Yeah, they sort of changed corn's sort of ethos, haven't they, a bit from being like honor and just general combat and stuff to a bit more mindless murder rage a bit, haven't they? Haven't they? I'm not sure. I I will admit that I need to read <clears throat> more of the corn uh corn focused books. But from the um from the ones that I have read, such as um all of the corn books uh, Karn the Betrayer books. He is a very common tactical murder machine. Apart from except, when he's not. Except <laughs> in the most recent book where they literally wrote, wrote him as an orc. Yeah, I mean, AOS Corn is definitely a lot more Kiln Bane Burn than his 40k counterpart, although I'm not sure quite how they're treating his 40k counterpart. Like, although we do know that he will. Like, Korn will work with his arch enemy, Slanesh, just to best the Imperium, so. Yeah, but Zinch will also do that with Nurgle for the same goal at some point. They'll, yep. They'll work with each other when it suits them. They just yep. don't like each other. I just find it weird that in AOS, most of Korn's worshippers are Luchadors. In AOS, most of Korn's worshippers are the Bloodbound, who are slavers borderline psychopaths. Like, do, the, I don't like the Bloodbound at all. They, but they anyway. look like luchadors because they've like, got the Mexican wrestling masks on their face. They're helmets. They look like masks. They look like... An, it's an army of angry... Ray, is the helmet is also a mask. It's an army of angry Rey Mysterios. So, and now I've got the image of a Blood Reaver 619ing a Stormcast in the face through a tree. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> It makes, you want, it makes you wonder if their war cry is Boyaka, Boyaka. <laughs> question, for, question for Alexis. What is the purpose of Grey Knights since Sisters of Silence and Custodes make them obsolete? 
Um, having multiple forces in the Imperium that can do the same thing is just a good idea. Because the Imperium is spread so thin with their million worlds that the Custodians, the Sisters, the Sisters of Battle, even though they number like, well, the Sisters of Battle number in the millions, they can't be everywhere at once. Yeah, the Grey Knights are sort of, the, the Grey Knights were spread incredibly thin, like individual squads watching over entire regions of space just so they could get there in case something happened. They were super also, thin. in the um, not the Carrion Throne the Emperor's Legion book, um, the Custodian Guard is fighting alongside the Grey Knight and the Silent Sisterhood and the Grey Knights had to switch up their entire fighting style to fight alongside them, but they did eventually complement them. Uh, the Custodian um makes a mention of that they would be the space marines to replace them. Okay. So okay. take that. Yeah. Question for... So yeah, I know my lore. Question for Michael. If an Earth cast can be given a battle suit, can the Tau design a mobile air battle suit for the air cast? Well, they designed the Cold Star battle suit, and that can kind of fly. The thing is, the Earth cast... Oh, sorry, the air cast uh, can't really deal with atmosphere very well. Their biology is kind of suited to the low gravity of space stations and ships and such. As a result, the suit they would have to develop would have to be incredibly difficult to puncture and at a different gravity and pressure on the inside to the external pressure. So can it be done? Possibly. Will it be done? No. The only air cast you'll see in gravity are the pilots of the bombers uh, because they're actually air cast vehicles. They're not fire cast piloted. Um, also, the thing about the earth cast getting battle suit, that is literally only my character. So, um, Did, now didn't Ovesa get one? Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Ovesa. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Duh. I mean, how, how can you forget mm. the guy who, you know, who wanted to enslave the crew to make them, you know, into cyborg servitors? He's one of the eight. Hashtag that free is... the crew. Hashtag free the crew. Yeah, that, that, that's a failure on my part. I've forgotten a member of the eight. I used to be able to recite the eight by name. I'm so bad. You mean the Tower Rangers? It's okay, Michael. We still hate you. I know. <laughs> right. Another Tau question. Have the Tau fought any legitimate Titans yet? Or wasn't their massive battle... Wasn't their biggest battle suit, you know, the one that's literally nothing more than a walking artillery platform, wasn't that built in response to Titans? But it might have been Knights. I can't remember if it was built for Knights. Well, I mean, the only time that they would run into Titans is the Damocles Gulf. Yeah, I'm trying to put my finger on whether there is a confirmed engine kill. Uh, I can't remember. Didn't like the Imperium say, yeah, we got Titans in the tower, like, yeah, making giant walking machines the size of skyscrapers, yeah, f- yeah, right. Uh, oh, they actually fucking did it. <laughs> well, I mean, the Orcs didn't have Titans until they saw the Imperiums. Right, because the Orcs got impressed. I know like, that we, sounds... we need to do that. We need to make our own, because that's they, you can have more um, Daka. So it comes from Wa Orcs. There's a story of uh, a big mech who's getting... His forces are just getting absolutely annihilated by um, by this titan. And, they're look, and he's looking up on it. And he's just like hearing the voices of Gork and Mork just say, Build me, build me, build me, build me. And he's just like, oh, okay, I need to leave now. Speaking of the Orcs building okay, stuff... Bye. Um, I still find it a bit of a cop out that the guy who invented the Death Cop- Copter was Orchimedes, even though the Diganob supplement for Gorkumorka states that the guy who invented the Death Copter was Dregbeck Blitzkar. Nah. Inconsistency. Yes. Not an inconsistency. It's an orc. He didn't do it. I did it. I'm bigger. Uh, right. Oh, come on. You're supposed to start an argument with that. You're supposed to be like, well, I'm bigger, so I'm in charge. 
we we know I'm bigger than Chuck, so that's a, so that's no non non issue. Anyway, but your character's smaller than mine. Yes, but it, it's harder for you to be bigger than me than when you're on the floor with a purity seal setting a shock through your body. All right, that's just rude. <laughs> right. Yeah, there, there, I've, I've just looked it up. Uh, there are titans in the Dalmor Queen's Gulf through Sade, the Legio Thanataris. There you go. Okay. How militarily powerful and technologically advanced was the Dark Age of Technology humanity in comparison to the Eldar Empire of its time? Nowhere near on the Eldar's level, I would have to say. Considering yeah, Eldar. way beyond the Imperium. Like, just look at the Speranza from the Priest of Mars series. Dear God. But not quite on the Eldar's level, no. No. Okay. Next question. I am new to the hobby and want to build a Space Marine or Imperial Guard army. I already own the Space Marine half of the No No Fear box set. Is this a good idea and what should I buy? Désolé pour le faux dans mon commentaire. Le correcteur de mon téléphone est coincé en français. Oh my god, that's the, that, that, thank god that French was okay. I remember that comment. It's just, uh, Désolé pour le faux de dans mon commentaire. Car l'autre correcteur est en français. Uh, yeah. See, this is why we kill the Tau. <laughs> Shut up. And in fairness, I haven't had to speak French since my GCSEs. To be fair, the moment you started reading that comment, I panicked, like, oh god, there's French at the bottom, and I don't know how he's going to handle it. So you did pretty well, to be fair. Well, I've got <clears> B <throat> on my French, so... Alright, I'm going to assume that I'm going to be the one answering this one. You know space brains. Okay, if you have the No No Fear box set, you have Primaris Marines. And if you're new to the game, I would highly suggest that you continue the Primaris Marine line as they are built and intended for newer players. The lore is fairly reasonable. It's not a lot because they're Primaris Marines. As for armies and what you should go for for your next build, you have a really good start, but I would grab, if I were you, uh, more Hellblasters as they are one of the best Primaris Space Marine units. You have your two HQs, you, you have your three troops, and yeah, just get some more Hellblasters. Uh, one of the best buys that you could do is actually get another No No Fear box set. Certainly not a bad call. Okay. How would things be if it was Ferris Manus who killed Fulgrim, or at least survived the confrontation? What would he be doing during the Horus Heresy, and what would change in the war, and what would he do after the war? Uh, well, he that, wouldn't kill there's, a lot, there's a lot of questions built into one question there. So, train going by. Yes. Let's, okay, let's assume both Fulgrim and Manus live, because as Alexis said, there's no way that, particularly with the scenario as it was, Manus was killing Fulgrim. If Manus survives, more than likely, either he learns his lesson of charging ahead like an idiot, and the Iron Hands become quite useful harrying forces, a la Shadrach Medusin, or he completely throws them away because he doesn't know what he's doing and he's a not very good, patient commander. One of the two. I think. Actually, a, a funny scenario to that would be if he actually talked to Fulgrim instead of fight him, and Fulgrim repented. To be fair, Fulgrim should have repented after he killed Manus, but that's beside the point. Yeah, he pussied out. He was lost. He pussied yeah. out and let a demon possess him. He did he wanted, not pussy out. He wanted oblivion. I'm sorry, there's no defense. Uh, I, some parts of Fulgrim I can deal with, that I can't. No, Fulgrim did not pussy out. He also bested the demon later on and saw what he did and was okay with it. At the time, he was dealing with grief. Fine. But, okay, run your hypothetical... Well, that's, that's girl. Okay, run your uh, repentance scenario there. What happens? Um, I don't really know after that. Like, probably Fulgrim would engage Horus in... It avoid warfare. And, and that, considering that Fulgrim is better at void warfare than Horus, he would have done damn well against him. 
yeah, the challenge comes at what point, because Fulgrim would have to get into the void to do that. And we do know that the other traitors had pretty much, it was nigh on impossible to get planet side and out again. That's true, but Fulgrim could have played the I'm still a heretic card and walked out. To which Horus would probably say, why did you let Ferris Manus live? He got away. It's possible. Like, there's a lot of it, some buts and maybes, and to be if honest... somebody can catch a freaking laser beam, then I'm going to say that it's possible. Oh yeah, when where Ferris Manus is involved, anything is on the table at this point, because goddamn, that man is now a plot hole. Um, I wouldn't call him but... a plot hole, he's dead. Well, was a plot hole. Sorry, past tense. Uh, He's become but, more of a plot hole after he died, actually, now I think about it, because his magical fingers. Yeah, I know. That Eldred, El- that Eldred Ulfra now has a collection of. Oh, man, that's you silly, silly boy. Uh, but yeah, I, I honestly think that... I don't think Manus had the charisma to turn Fulgrim, even if he tried, because they, ch- they had the parlay before Istvan, where... Fulgrim tried to turn Manus and failed. I don't think Manus had the charisma to turn Fulgrim because Fulgrim was turned pretty much between the charisma of Horus and the corruption of the Layer Blade to some extent or another. So I don't think, unless it was a Horus or maybe a Gilliman, talking Fulgrim round was possible. Ferris Manus had the charisma of a prawn sandwich. He only had one personality trait and I was pissed off. I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> no, I yeah. yeah, not not the angry rage of, of Angron. He was just kind of like, you know, the feeling Resting you get. Bitch face personifier. I was going to say no, more. Fe- I was going to say the feeling you get if you accidentally step in dog shit and you get the bad mood because of it. That was oh, his person. So that, was his, that was his personality trait for the entirety of you know the Great Crusade. I would have said he's like he has the personality traits of an angry fanboy. No, an angry fanboy is far more loud and obnoxious. And high pitched. <laughs> yeah, Fer- like Ferris Manus is like when you I try to think of like how Fer- like mad Ferris Manus. I'm trying to think of like what happens when you piss Dawn off. Like it's not it's that My worst. normal calm demeanor was broken. Compromise. Uh, whatever. I haven't seen that in forever. Yeah, it's just like it's not like over the top angry. It's just that cold, calculating fury. It's like honestly, is more terrifying. Yeah, when first was, was angry though, he went off like a bull in the china shop. CS Band Five. He's like, like Ferris smash. Oh, Ferris fall down, lose head. To be honest, I, I'm not. Uh, this is good. All right. If the Raven Garden Salamanders had followed Manus and kept pushing, could they have? Would they have still? still would they have all died, or could they have actually made a difference? Because obviously, Manus was left completely isolated and refused to fall back when Vulcan and Korax did. If they kept pushing, considering how you know strong Ferris and Vulcan both were with the speed of Korax, you know nipping in here and there, they could have broken through. Hmm. No. The prob- it would have been extremely bloody, and there would have been a lot of losses on both sides, but they could have done it, because, let's be honest, in a, you know, straight on fight, when you've got Ferris Manus and Vulcan side by side, swinging their massive hammers around the place, just creating like a fucking tornado of destruction, it's going to be hard for anyone to get in close. Yeah, I and plus- still think that everybody else would have beaten them. In fact, it might have been an easier fight for them because Fulgrim set up a perfect battle plan. The Well, it, maybe Fulgrim would have been able to just out-defend them, but the fun thing comes with the, four, with the other four traitors. Because if the, other, if the loyalists don't fall back, they don't run, run into the trap. So if yeah. they keep pushing, there's a chance, chance they could take the defences, or at least enough defences, to dig in and when the cannons come raining down from the Iron Warriors, they've got something to hold, and then it's this turn three all over again, and we know how that ended. Yeah. 
And plus, I mean, I still think that it would have, it would have, I think the lawyers would have still lost and it would have probably been even worse because they'd have been completely stuck. But, yeah. They would have, they would have done more damage, though. Hmm. I think there'd have been at least one dead traitor, but I think all three loyalist primarchs would have died. Well, two of them. Because one of the Vulcan member, he'll just come back up ten minutes later and smash Point him. taken. Point <laughs> taken. Uh, but yeah, I think Fulgrim, had he had Manus been supported, might, might have died. Might. Yeah. Excuse your next words by Wesley Tao. <laughs> I said might, and I'm also relying on Vulcan being there. But anyway, it's it's just an interesting hypothetical. Is that obviously, is Van Five is a, a case of loyalist dis discord leads to absolute disaster. Is that the one time the loyalists were worse organised than the traitors. Right, moving on. Next question: Khan the betrayer versus Caiaphas Kane. Who wins? Khan. Yeah, I'm going to have to go for Khan as well. I mean, yeah. Kind of green versus awesome. human who's not Sly Marvo. End of discussion. Okay. What do you think Games Workshop will do to mess with fans on April 1st? To which someone replied, Plastic Sisters. I don't think it would be Plastic Sisters. I think it would just be like some type of... Uh funny comic or something involving like a love story or something like that. Yeah, because the Valentine's Day one with the where they used the Valentine's Day to set up the Daughters of Cain was very, very good. They might do something like that. Pretend they like, almost pretend to troll you when they're not trolling you. I'm just hoping they would do like a teaser for like, you know, Codex Squirt. Oh, never mind, we lost it. It got eaten. That would be funny. Okay, if there's a 40k version of Dungeons and Dragons, would you play it? Uh, it exists as yes, Dark Heresy so, games as well as Death Watch games. Yeah, it's, it's literally all the Fantasy Flight games. They're all amazing. And in fact, you can see them on my channel and my Twitch channel where I killed my entire party. Oopsie daisy. Okay, did the birth of the first three Chaos Gods create massive warp storms during their gestation period like we would later sleep see in Slanesh? I would assume so, but we won't know for certain, considering that their gestation happened, you know, back in, you know, prior to the Middle Ages from 65 million years ago onwards. Yeah. So I'm just going to assume yes. Almost certainly. How would have Ferris Manus and Sanguinius reacted to the Codex Astartes? Sanguinius would have been fine... Probably Manus would have taken it very, very badly. Yeah. But pardon me, can you also imagine Manus separating each um, chapter, like, separating chapters according to clan, so each clan becomes a chapter. And I could also see Sanguinius actually having a problem with it because he wants to keep an eye on everybody because of the flaw. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Bit of a weird question, were some of the famous events like Betrayal at Kelf, the Massacre on Istvan, etc. known prior to the Horus Heresy novels? Istvan definitely was, because that was mentioned in 2nd edition. Uh, Kelf is more of a recent thing, I feel. I think Prospero, I think, is really old. I think. Yeah, yeah, Prospero was mentioned in the 2nd edition Chaos Codex. Istvan 5 was mentioned in the Ultramarines Codex. Which was the Space Marine Codex by another name. But let's be honest, all Space Marine Codexes are Codex Ultramarines. Ew. Especially this edition. I thought it was Raven Guard. Okay. If Abaddon manages to once again lay siege to Terra and have the different Chaos Primarchs plus their legions at his side, do you think he might actually manage to conquer Terra? No. Even if he takes Terra. Killing the Emperor would be his ultimate mistake. So, in theory, he might take it, but he wouldn't hold it. Because something would happen with the Golden Throne, and he'd fuck it up. Funny thing or as well. it'd be revealed that he's actually a good guy all along. 
Funny thing, going back to Old Earth, Eldrad Ulfran shows Vulcan a vision of the future where the webway over basically bursts open within the Imperial Palace, demons overflow the Imperial Palace, kill the custodians, and kill a wizened, rotting carcass sitting upon a golden throne. So that's literally what happens when the Emperor breaks his concentration for five minutes. Yeah. Interesting thing, okay. yeah, interesting thing yeah, Eldra didn't refer to that figure as the Emperor, just the rotting figure on the Golden Throne. Well, obviously he wasn't, because, you know, we like to tease our fan base and not make things blatantly obvious. Yes. Even when they are blatantly obvious. Right. Yeah. Right. Do you think Horus actually elevated Abaddon to the status of Primarch? Define what? elevated. I actually saw this question, and apparently Horus has the ability to do that. <clears throat> and I'm not even like kidding. Like that—that's a thing. I'm gonna have to see a source on that. I will try to find it as soon as I can, but I know that he's done something similar to that. Fair enough. But would he do it to Abaddon? No. Towards the end of it, he hated Abaddon. I'd like to see a source on that as well. I mean, it's in the Kion book. He's just like, they just hate each other. Fair enough. As TTS fans, we are used to seeing the Koas gods bigger amongst themselves, but how often do they actually speak in canon, excluding, of course, demons or followers who claim to speak their word? Well, in all fairness, the demons themselves do speak one word of the Chaos gods. It's what they were made for. I know, but they're saying excluding demons. Yeah, but that doesn't depends, mean that they're wrong. It depends on what you define as speak. Are we talking speak to their followers, speak to their demons? I'm or guessing actually... speak, speak to mortals. Because we know that in the Dawn of War games, Korn speaks to Gabriel Angelos. That was a weird yeah, thing. Yeah, and, and we do know that the gods do talk to each other because Slanesh made the bargain that led to the creation of the thing that led to Corflitch Lothart. I can't remember what the name of it's called. I think it's the Murder Val or something. Uh, because then I should made a deal with the other gods to make that happen. But to mortals, the l only other one I can think of actually doing it directly is like the ones involving Voltarian and Magnus. Mm. I would assume they would have spoken to Horus as well, considering you know he had to undergo their trials. <laughs> okay, yeah, fair point, fair point. But yeah, they, they only seem to talk to the really big players. Okay, what's everyone's favorite Imperial Guard regiment? Ooh. Um, I gotta go with the Cadians. Michael? Probably Cathachan. Fine, I'll be the patron and say the Praetorians. Uh, the other one for me is Elysia, but I just think Elysians are cool, and I do like the Death Core. Yeah, Death Core are cool. Elysia is cool. Valhalla, Volstroia, Mordian. Macadian Janissaries. Because cool. they got those cool masks. Or the Chem Dogs. The Chem Dogs are also cool. Yeah, the Black Chem Dogs and the other Penal Legions. That's true. Oh, what about um, the, the Mordians? The Mordians are the badass ones. They're the real badass ones. Yeah, the that, Mordians are cool. The Steel Legion are pretty badass as well. The Vastorians are awesome. And you can learn about all of them in my Regiment of Renown Ball series, which just finished. Insert shameless plug here. But we all know the best of them all huh. is the Attilan Rough Riders. The yeah, Attilans are cool. Right. Will we ever get Codex Machine Spirits? No. No. We might get a Dark Mechanicum. I think we should get a Dark Mechanicum. Uh, what about an end times 40k one edition and the next it never happened? We already got that in third edition with Codex Eye of Terror. 
Uh, yeah, we also did get a soft end times with the fall of Cadia. Yeah, it was like games was was we can't do an end times again because well look what happened. Uh, but <clears throat> we still need to move the plot forward, so here you go. We can't do an end times. Look what happened. Our sales went up and people are actually playing this game. I know, I know, but I I'm yeah, I'm speaking I'm speaking for the people who don't like Age of Sigma for the first time ever. Truthfully, you mean like five yeah. percent? I know, but they're a very loud five percent, bloody hell. <laughs> if the Imperium made a large push to increase the quality of life for its citizens, would the resulting decrease of misery also weaken the forces of chaos? Um, sort of. Well, I mean, it wouldn't of really affect Nurgle. Your standard of life depends on what world you're born in anyway. Yeah, it's a bit <laughs> of a yeah, but no, but. Um, if you want to learn more about the Imperial worlds themselves, read the Heresy Rogue, uh, the the Dark Heresy and the Rogue Trader books. They're really good on describing the worlds. Yeah, there's also a very short uh, double-page spread on the different classifications of worlds in the 8th edition rulebook if you can't dig those out. Suffice to say, if you're born on someone like, say, within the Ultramar Empire, you're probably going to be doing all right. And again, if you're born on, say, a blasted death world with a radiated sun turning your skin to putty, you're going to be pretty fucked. Yeah, there's only so much quality of life the Imperium can do because, you know, bureaucracy. Yeah. Yeah. But just remember this. If you fail to do your job, you might as well just kill yourself because you just wasted the Emperor's time. Indeed. Worker there, absence is not excused. Are there any chaos worlds that aren't shit to live on instead of a massive bloody LSD-induced super magic fuckfest, literally in Slanesh's case, maybe it's somewhere that the average Imperial citizen would like to live and raise their family? Okay, so getting... The whole Slanesh thing... Slanesh has artisan worlds. Like, literally worlds covered in beautiful art. That probably kill you well more than likely but it's still a beautiful world you can't just say every single slanesh world is terrible hell some of the chrome worlds are really nice uh, yeah the argument i was actually going to raise was the chrome worlds because the problem is it depends on what you class as places you want to live because there's beautiful on the sur surface and then there's somewhere you want to colonize and the two are very different things it's like there's some places you go on holiday and there's some places you'd live. Maybe that's asking, like, is there, like, a, a chaos demon world that is just basically the equivalent of sitting on a beach in Hawaii? Yes. In fact, that's actually explained in the book, um, well, in the short audio drama, Hand of Darkness, where Yvrain and the Vizark and a company of them uh, go to a Slanesh world, and it's literally a beach. Granted, the birds there were speaking... And making them just hate each other for deceit, but still, well, it was a beautiful world. See, that sounds more like Zinch's thing. Yeah, you would think so, right? Mm. Is it traditional to recite the hymn "It's Raining Men" while deploying in drop pods, only by battle brothers mm. named Carl? <laughs> yeah. Damn it, Carl. With Gilliman basically being the TTS Emperor and Vulcan's hugs being made canon, is there anything else from TTS you think Games Workshop will make canon, or at least hope they will? Um, well, they canonised the Custodians leaving Terra. That's also a thing. They also canonised um, stupid brain ghost Ferris, because Vulcan has visions of Ferris Mass's ghost. Yeah, and they kind of did a lot. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, the Emperor talking would probably be one of my favorites, like how he's disappointed and everything. I thought that was what the, the that was the implication of the conversation from Dark Imperium, wasn't it? It was, but I want to see it, like read it. Valid, valid. Um, I'm trying to think now. Does anything else? Boosh is screaming, hey, gal pals. No, that can get in the bin. Um, his, his book was very, very weird. 
Like, he starts off the book literally as just his head sitting in a pile of meaty sludge, and then he reforms himself and finds there's a mutant performing oral sex on his sword. It's very weird. There's giant screaming spider babies, and it's it's a very weird book. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably put that down after about ten pages and never picked it up again for fear of losing my lunch. I enjoyed it. It's a good book. Okay. Very descriptive. <laughs> well, like that time when um, Lucius got his ass handed to him by the uh, World Eaters champion. That was beautiful. Right. Literally everybody beats Lucius. It's kind of a joke at this point. I am the unbeatable Lucius. Except that one time that I got beaten by that guy, and that guy, and that guy, and that guy. Good thing I keep coming back to life. Anyway. Yeah. At what point... We- at what point will you decide that, yes, I've had enough knowledge of 40k law to start making videos about it? Enough what? Basically, when did you just, when did you feel you had enough law of 40k, you knew enough about it to start making videos about it? Um, I never had that moment. I just made law videos. Uh, the first few law videos were just me talking about things I found interesting that I'd read. Uh, as for more recently... I've been learning as I go. If it's not obvious from the podcast, I learn as I go. Every day's a school day. Just put it that, that, that way. Yeah, I started off doing like book reports for 40K. And then I was like, I can make a series out of this. And then I kind of radically changed my channel to not do that. And then we brought it back. Okay. What do you think of the idea of an avatar of Cain being desecrated enough for a keeper of secrets to possess it? It already happened. Yeah, that's happened. I was going to say, that's happened. Yeah. Okay. Could Marbus, the fallen demon prince with the head of a Calibanite lion, be Zahariel? Zahariel is the only Calibanite, not the lion himself, to have killed a Calibanite lion. Assuming that Zahariel, a powerful psychic, is not Cypher. This makes sense. That's what the question says. Um, That'd be actually an interesting twist, if... Mm. The problem is Zahariel and Cipher. It, it, Cipher is so well, it's, it's enigmatic that it's kind of hard to know whether you're coming or going with him. So you can't really say anything about people who were or are him. It's hard mm. to say. I mean, Zahariel was an out and out traitor, which the current Cipher may or may not be. It depends. If we get any more Dark Angels focused books. In Horus Heresy. I still don't think he's uh I don't think he, he's an actual traitor. Are we talking Cypher or Zahariel or both? Cypher. Yeah, that's what makes you think that the current Cypher may not be Zahariel. Which does open up the potential for but to be fair though, like most demon princes when they ascend keep their name or part of their name, don't they? Mm-hmm. It well, it it, dep- it depends because some of them will take a new name based partly on their name. Like yeah, like Marlock Ca- Malok Cartho became Macar. Macar, yeah. So I yeah. think it depends because then you get guys like say Angron who became Angron, real original there. So I think it really purely depends on the individual. Yeah. Right, okay. Can Necrons create new Necrons, or is there a finite number of them? They can make new bodies and basically download them engrams into the new bodies. But I don't there think is, they... however, a finite... There is technically a finite number based on the amount of original Necrons here. Is there not? No, yes. because the Necrons In, don't... It's, it's, it's yes they're... and no. Their bodies, they're, it's not a soul that's in their bodies. It's, no, it's just programming. Consumed. Yeah, it, it's, so I think... They, in regard, there's, there's, they can remake bodies all to their heart's content, but there's, there's a finite number of the engrams. Yeah, I think there's also probably a finite number, when we talk about the whole soul thing, um, obviously the lower rank Necron warriors are pretty much nothing but code. 
So they could probably be replicated a lot more, but there is a finite number of cryptex and lords and overlords because they have very, unless they're able to replicate their personality, Bofkov probably Trazin, it's, it, there is probably a finite number of leader necrons, but an infinite number of actual necrons. Also, it depends on who attacks the tomb world, because orcs have gone in and destroyed the bodies as they were being made. Or rebuilt. True. We're not, we're not counting, like, for in, in terms of a fight. We're just thinking, like, as a actual thing. As a race. Yeah. Yeah. Because unlike Tyranids, where they, they do communicate to different high fleets and make Norn Queens based on high fleet losses... The two worlds uh, don't talk. The two worlds hate each other. In some cases, yes. Yeah. Yes, because some of them still think they're in the secessionist wars, and some... Cop, cop, soundtrack. Yeah. Right. Um, does Farsight follow the standard Tau lifespan? It always confused me how Tau characters work given their short lifespans, yet an event in 40k can take course over the span of multiple Tau lifetimes. It's because of his magical sword essentially. Yes. The Dawnblade, which is Farsight's weapon, is a chronophagic alloy. Literally, it steals the life force of anyone it kills and adds their remaining natural lifespan and adds it to the wielder. So let's say a person would have lived and died at the age of, let's be arbitrary and say 80, and they are killed by the Dawnblade at the age of 40, they would naturally have lived another 40 years, so the wielder of the Dawnblade lives another 40 years. It's a death note, sword. Now, the, the real question is, what happens if, say, Farsight manages to, I don't know, slay a Primarch who are supposedly biologically immortal with no upper limit on their lifespan? Does that mean Farsight's now immortal? As long as... The thing is, I don't know how the work, the work, the work of the Dawnblade like, works in terms of does it pass it on to its current wielder or does it add it on to its wheel now, and then when it changes hands, it doesn't like stop that person having an infinite lifespan. It depends, because if, if it's a case of, while you have the blade, you live forever, Farsight can, would be able to die. If it was a case of, it adds it on, and no matter what, then yes, Farsight would biologically live forever, but he can still be killed, because Primarchs can still be killed. Yes. Right, I'm going to pick one, just one more question considering the time limit, because we're coming up to the two-hour mark. All right, oh, so yeah. uh, let's pick, let's find a decent one. Da, 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 da. Right. Can Games Workshop rehabilitate Abaddon to the fans so he isn't seen as just a failure, and if so, how? If they would read the damn books, Abaddon is actually awesome. Yes, but the fans still don't like him that much by comparison to why they should. Just read the damn books. I know, but Abaddon is like Roman Reigns. He's supposed uh, to be popular, but people just don't like him. Yes, but the thing is, Abaddon's not being shoved down everyone's throat and being told we have to cheer him. Point taken. And we didn't mm -hmm. have that stupid bullshit with the Royal Rumble where he had defended the title and then came out in the fucking Royal Rumble match at number 30 when everyone wanted Finn Balor or Samoa Joe. I have no idea what you're saying now. <laughs> Michael does. How do you feel when you two talk about anime? But yes, yeah, I, I do know enough. what you're saying. But, uh, I yeah, think we, like... we should have, maybe, like if we get like a Black Legion codex like we did with 7th edition, maybe have, I don't know, Abaddon have a few more important victories under his belt. Maybe he like, I oh, know he wipes out a couple of Space Marine chapters, ones that no one's ever heard of, or something. You know, just say, look, this guy's, he blew up Cadia, he's wiped out several Space Marine chapters, he bitch slapped, I don't know, he, get, he got into a fight with Gilliman and fought him to a standstill, or something. I don't know. Yeah, it's a case of, in, like, for the longest in time. Just, in just Battlefleet Gothic. He took 14 million lives in one shot. Planet kill. And detonated a sun. Is that 14 million? 
Oh, 14 billion. Sorry. I was going to say that's a very, very small number for a star system. But yeah, the problem is, I, I think Abaddon got his reputation, let's say, off the back of just long time never being able to win because of the way the 13th Black Crusade was set up. I personally and, think it's actually because of his model. And that definitely didn't help with the particular nickname he got. He does need a new model, let's be honest. It's been the same model since 1996. Hmm. But the problem is, it's it's going to be a very slow turnaround, because the law that makes Abaddon look like and feel like a badass is only in a smattering of books, and it's sort of only in particularly a couple of places, like the Black Legion novels. That's the problem, is that the general... It, it takes a lot of actual general change to change the general public's mind on a person or a character or whatever it won't be a case of one really good novel changes everybody's mind it's going to be a slower burn than that i'll tell you what you should do they should do what they did in third edition before they retconned it have him kill off a major character because in third edition he actually killed off eldrad ultran then they retconned it so that never happened but have him get into a fight with a really well-known character, and kill them off. Maybe, I don't know, maybe killing off Calgar, for example. He gets Matt quite... and his Calgar would be a good one. He gets, <laughs> you know, or maybe Logan Grimnar, so Ragnar Blackman can take over the Space Wolves or something. Yeah, or perhaps maybe Gabriel Seth is sort of a mimicry of Horus and Sanguinius, and that sort of drives Dan, that like gives Dan to even more reason to hate him, or whatever. Yeah. If, if, That's a good idea. If Horus kills off a, ma- a major character, then that will probably help a lot of his reputation, or at the very least, have people turn around and say, well, that person was even worse than Abaddon. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you've got to make Abaddon look like a threat. He's got to be like, credible. Him... He's got, you've got to have him kill off either a major character or destroy another major location. Yeah, it... It's all well and good having him do one really badass thing and his character as a sort of who he is being quite borderline likable for a Chaos Space Marine. But you have to back up his character with deeds. And at this point, he's got the Gothic, he's got the Black Crusades, which are, yes, victories, but people can sort of forget that. You have the Fall of Cadia and that's it. Can you, can you that's, imagine? I think, his problem. Right. Mad crazy idea. But you know in one of the earliest Black Crusades, Rogel Dorn went missing? Have, uh-huh. have Abaddon claim that he was the one who killed Rogel Dorn? Because I mean, he, he killed Sigismund, so He killed Sigismund, he killed a clone of Horus. It's, yeah. So he can turn around, so he can, like, go around showing the Tower of Horus, like, this has the blood of three Primarchs on it. I mean, just being around the talent of horrors drives people crazy. Mind of the um, second edition special rules for the talent of Horus. Imperial forces suffer from terror from the talent of Horus, except for blood angels who suffer from the effects of hatred. Well, the hatred thing for blood angels is still was still a thing in sixth edition. Was hatred That's still a rule back then? He, yeah, it was introduced in Sick. Abaddon had Blood Angels hate Abaddon. Oh, cool. So I know they got rid of the hatred rule back in 3rd edition, I think. And they had it back in... Um, I think I don't know if they had it in 5th, but they definitely had it in 6th. They had it in 6th and 7th. Right. It's back when you had fear, terror, hatred, frenzy. Yeah, frenzy, frenzy, terror, and oh, stupidity stupid. never made yes. it to 40k, but... No, stupidity yes. was in second edition. I remember that. Hmm. Stupidity I, made it all the way to fourth edition. Yeah, the best stupidity I can always... I, I love the one I always remember is Sigval, uh, the former champion of Slanesh. Like he uh, keeps looking into his mirror, doesn't he? Yeah, he looks into his mirrored shield and admiring his own reflection, so he suffers from the effects of stupidity. Right, and that'll be it for the questions this time. Um, so if we didn't ask you a question, uh, leave it in the comment section below. We'll get to it next time. Certainly try to. So does anybody have any particular rants they haven't got off their chest already? 
I've already mentioned mine. I'm just excited about the new uh, Sister of Battle book. Yeah, and my rants are not really hobby related, so not for the podcast. So, in that case, I think, unless there's anything else to add, goldfish are cool. In that case, yes, that is nothing else to add. So that will be the end of today's episode of Adeptus Podcast. I do hope you've enjoyed it. It's been a bit uh, a bit less crazy than usual with a bit more reflection and uh, deep discussion. But from the Gav Thorpe episode, you seem to quite like that. So hopefully you enjoyed this one as well. Uh, leave your questions in the comments below. If we did miss them from last time, we do apologize. And we'll endeavor to get around to at least some of them next time, depending on time constraints. So uh, with all that said, Thank you very much for watching. This has been Tactica Imperialis. This has been Remnants from 40k Theories. And I'm Alexis. And we'll see you all next time.